Uh, Sarah, thank you very much. Um, uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is neoliberalism, um, and um, that's not the cheeriest subject. But um, I want to, when you're in a, an economic system, it's really difficult for you to get out of it to be able to understand where you're at, right? Um, and this guy, Alan Greenspan, he has peddled an, an uh, a orthodoxy which, frankly, isn't worth um, the, the paper it's written on. <laughs> um, this is us, Four Horsemen, Renegade Inc. Um, we made this film critiquing neoclassical economics. Have you seen it? Has anyone seen it? Nobody. It's better. One, two, three. It's better than The Godfather Part Two. Huh? Four Horsemen. It's on YouTube. We had to give it away because everyone was nicking it. Um, but um, it critiques neoclassical economics. So um, the woman who divided the country, and this is a philosophy on the front page of the Daily Mirror, <laughs> but um, they got it right. And, and everybody, you know, her, her key, her flagship moment was property-owning democracy. And um, I just want to explain what that looks like in a graph. This is where she came to power, Margaret Thatcher. And this is uh, UK private debt since 1880. So what you see here is it trundling along, dip here, Great Depression, spiked a little bit in the Great Depression, and down, and trundled, trundled. And she, she came to power here, and look at this. So that's the 2008 crisis there. And then what we have, and this is courtesy of Steve Keen, by the way. Uh, and this, this is private debt, uh, and, and the key point is private debt. Private, not, not public debt, not government debt, private debt. And private debt, the velocity and the volume of private debt is what drives crises in the neoliberal system. And neoliberalism, or neoclassical economics, is fundamentally flawed. Everybody says that, that, that neoclassical economics, or, or the economy, has failed. It hasn't. It, the, the economy in the West has worked perfectly according to the neoliberal, neoclassical principles it has been set on. Right? So when they say the economy's failed, yes, it's failed for the majority of people on the planet, no doubt, but it's worked perfectly according to the rules. And let me tell you something that might shock you. When neoliberalism is peddled, and it's taught at every Ivy League university in the world, um, there, there are three things that neoliberal, neoclassical economists leave out of their models. Do you know what those three things are? Housing, it, kind of. There are three factors of production as well, and that, that is the one that's left out. Let me tell you, the three things that neoclassical economists leave out of their models are banks, debt, and money. <laughs> right. It's laughable, right? It's like going to the doctor and saying, look, I'm not too well. But when you're having a look, forget the lungs and the heart and the brain. Forget all that. You go, yeah, but hang on. So if you leave banks, debt, and money out of your economic modeling, how possibly can you say that you can predict, uh, uh, model an economy properly or predict any crisis? The point is that crises aren't in their models, and this is the hubris. Because the crisis isn't in their models, the crisis can't happen. Private debt... The volume of private debt and the velocity of that debt uh, drives us to crises. Black swans are nonsense. When an aircraft goes down, we have an incredible amount of uh, um, research and, and, and review into why that happened. When an economy crashes, nothing. Literally nothing. Right? This is the graph that we should be looking at. And this is one of the, the fundamental reasons, and Sarah's just um, pointed out the symptoms. So the, what I want to do is, is, is show the, uh, um, the absolute root causes of, of where we're at. Keep this in your minds. So she divided um, a nation by, uh, by using private debt. Those who have and those who haven't, or, or don't have, the haves and have-nots. So uh, as we know, uh, property-owning democracy, um, I, I, I interviewed Fergus Wilson. Does anyone know that name? He's the Bytelet King in Ashford in Kent. He owned 950 houses. Uh, and now he's sold them to the Chinese, or half of them to the Chinese. Did you know about this guy? No? Um, and I said to him during the interview, Fergus, um, did you use your money to do this? And he went, no, no. And banks, of course, love Fergus because they can pull rent out of him. And who's on the hook when Fergus falls over or can't meet their payments? The taxpayer. Why? Because he's too big to fail. And what's happened through the gentrification, and that's a very um, sort of uh, top end or, or a very extreme case, but the buy-to-let market is this personified, and as is the housing market itself. But what we've got it now is on turbocharge. Social enterprise, um, better services and improved uh, infrastructure lead to uh, increased quality of life, 
Therefore, uh, communities become more desirable to live in. Community wealth is privatized. Wealth inequality um, begins to take off, and all the negative indicators, and then you have social and economic issues. And there's a very, very good reason for this, and um, we'll get to it. But what drives it all is obviously a very extractive industry. It isn't the oil game, it's the banking game. It's selling the private debt that I was talking about earlier. In um, it, selling the private debt, uh, are we okay? You'll beaver away and we'll, we'll get back. Um, but it's selling the private debt because fundamentally banks make money out of selling debt. Money that's incidentally created out of thin air and then lent to interest. Um, so if you have a huge financial system, if you have a huge banking system, um, which is fundamentally, uh, um, let's say, unsustainable, which is what we saw in 2008, of course it's going to topple over. Because uh, the people that you're selling this private debt to, the real economy doesn't have the capacity to be able to meet the, the, the needs of, of that debt or selling that debt. Does that make sense? So, um, uh, are we good? Almost good. Well, you can see it there. I can see it there. Could you give a yeah. tax of sugar example about that? Just selling private debt. Yeah, so... Yes, because... Um, fundamentally, as house prices run away, just so we've used housing as an asset, wages have become suppressed. So we've augmented our income or our living standards by using private debt. And that's the uplift or the unearned increment or the unearned wealth within housing. So a bags of sugar version is that if I've made £100,000 extra you know, on my house, then, uh, or, or sorry, then somebody else hasn't. <laughs> somebody else has got to take that debt on. So it's greater fool theory, if you like, or a Ponzi scheme. Because the more debt that's created, is when money is debt, the more debt that's created, somebody has to harbor that uh, liability. And the reason why credit crunches happen is because the, people, uh, the, the, the liquidity within the system seizes up because no more people are coming in because they can't, because they're fundamentally unable to, because their wages won't meet that, the volume of capital. And what we have at the moment is a deflationary spiral Unlike, because the baby boomers often say, oh, well, you know, interest rates were 17% when I bought my house. Well, maybe, but you had inflation on your side, which meant that paying that debt back was an easier thing. All this is founded in rent-seeking. Um, and again, when it comes to neoclassical economics or neoliberalism, there are three factors of production uh, in economics, as we know, land, labor, and capital. Which one does neoclassical economics leave out of its, all of its thinking? Land. So, you're, so if you go to, go, go to Oxford University on the PPE course now, go and look in their library, it's probably Samuelson, it's all the economics books, look in the back. A very, very layman's uh, sort of test, if you like. The entries for capital will be huge in the index of every economics book. The entry for uh, labor, also huge. Go and have a look at how much they talk about land. It, it's, it's criminal actually. And people wonder why we're incentivized, why the economic system incentivizes us to trash the planet. It's because we don't see land. Not only do we not see land, we don't see it as a unique, we don't see it, at, that, we don't see that it sustains us. I mean, the hubris is phenomenal. I, I mean, and this is really where we're at. Don't worry, it's going to get positive in a minute. Um, so, so rent seeking is, um, and, and just so you know that I'm not talking absolute nonsense, he's a, an esteemed neoclassical economist, if there is such a thing, um, at Jeffrey Sachs, um, and I tweeted him uh, some time ago and said, you know, what's your view on rent seeking, on this extractive aspect of, of uh, the, the neoliberal system? And he says the UK, uh, sorry, the US political economy is now built on rent seeking, finance, military, industrial complex, healthcare, and fossil fuels. And I said to, to him, it's really edifying to hear such honesty about rent-seeking in the US. Um, and then he said, our political system has become utterly corrupted. Both parties it's a disgrace. Now, you don't have to go very far, ladies and gentlemen, to see that, um, the outcome of that. And what does Donald Trump do for a living? Tweets. Tweets. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, uh, so, you, so you can see that the ideology, the economics that have driven the developed West, however you want to define that, certainly the US, um, are, are, are fundamentally flawed. Um, and you're going to continue to get this uh, unstable, this destabilizing mechanism within the, the capitalist setup uh, unless this is, uh, all attention is put on this. 
So, um, very difficult to define this neoliberal liberalism word and idea, but it's a free market economic philosophy that favors the deregulation of markets. Back to the Big Bang, Thatcher in the 80s, uh, and um, get rid of taxes and, and, and tariffs, and then privatization of government functions, passing them over to private business, including housing. Including housing. And of course, what happens is the uh, not so real economy, the banking sector, uh, or the unreal economy, booms. And the real economy is starved because all the, the volume of capital that they need to keep that beast going, get, uh, the, the real economy is, is it's preyed upon. And all that money is extracted and pushed, excuse me, pushed into the banking sector. Do we recognize that? So we come back to the gentrification idea and the property-owning democracy, a big Tory rosette. And here's an here's a, 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 a airbag, if you like, or a break to what's going on here. Without freeholder obligation, community-created value is privatized into property values and then extracted. So what we see, I saw something in the uh, Daily Mail yesterday saying, this guy has worked out how to pay no tax on his buy-to-let portfolio. And, you know, is it triumphant? It's like, are you mad? Because exactly the same people in the Daily Mail are exactly the same people complaining about the uh, total lack of moral fiber within this country. That hoodies are running around in the street, that community centers are being knocked over, that, that, there's, that, 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 that uh, all the economic indicators, all the social indicators are going down. Meanwhile, they're sitting in nice houses and mortgage equity withdrawal things and going on cruises but they can't see that there's a uh, link between these two things. If you think that you can sit and live in a community and you don't have anything to uh, pay to that community, um, then how possibly do you think that community is going to thrive? It's not, just, it's not magic. Someone's going to come down and just say, well, this... Because what happens during a credit boom, what's happened since the mid-80s mid with all that private debt, is people have assumed a service mentality. Someone else is looking after it. And the very fact that you're all here this morning is you realize that nobody else is really looking after it. Government are clueless now. They don't really know what to do. Uh, they, they, they're, they're trying. And you can guarantee that private conversations are being had saying, my God, there is a real issue. Uh, because we can't crack the whip any harder. We can't enact any more austerity. There's a fundamental problem. Well, this is it. Because unless you have freeholder obligation to their communities, you have no buy-in. And uh, the social problems stem from there. What happens? Larry Summers, an arch neoclassical economist, the, God, uh, the nephew of Paul Samuelson, who writes all the textbooks without any reference to land. He says, uh, the United States may well be on its way to becoming a Downton Abbey economy. May well be on its way. It, it was there five, seven years ago. There's been, who in this room has had a meaningful wage increase? Nobody. Who in the U.S.? Why is Donald Trump so, uh, um, uh, I can say, well regarded? And that's wrong. Why is he so popular? But and why is he loved by people who used to have blue collar jobs? Because he's going to make America great again. What he's actually saying in that sentence is, "I'm going to give you your wages back, so you can have decent quality of life." Because I know, because and whether he knows this or not, I know that you're that, that you won't make money out of the housing market anymore. Why? Because it's gone away. That game's gone away. So we do have a two tier economy. And when we bring that to the national level and start to think about uh, nation states, let's go back to Adam Smith uh, and, and, um, and, have, and understand something that he understood, which is um, that profits are often highest in nations that are fastest going to ruin. Uh, there are many ways to create economic suicide on a national level. By the way, the Australians are doing it brilliantly at the moment. They're doing an excellent job. The major way throughout history has been indebting the economy. Again, private debt, I'm sorry to bang on. Debt always expands, madam, to your point. Debt always expands to reach a point where it cannot be paid by large swathes of the economy. That point is where austerity is imposted and ownership of wealth polarizes between the 1% and the 99%. So, so simple. It's so simple. It's just not part of the discourse. And the reason why it's not part of the discourse is because people like the BBC are scared to make it part of the discourse. Incidentally, we made Four Horse and we sent it to the BBC. And um, 
we got an email back saying this film has absolutely no place anywhere at the BBC. Um, so we picked that sentence up and put it on the back of the DVD <laughs> box and it sold. Uh, okay, so who's the problem? This guy. If you want to point to a moment in history, this guy really monumentally got it wrong. John Bates Clark, and he says uh, something which is so innocuous, so seemingly innocuous, but has massive ramifications. Because everybody understood until this guy came along, and the aristocracy, by the way, were, were amazed that people bought this lie back in the day, but they did, and they funded the lie. The communality between all classical economists was the distinction between earned income and unearned income. The vast majority of Donald Trump's wealth, if we're going to talk about America, is unearned. The Duke of Westminster's son, who's just inherited uh, the Westminster, the Grosvenor Estate, the, a, mass, uh, a vast majority of that is unearned wealth. It, it, uh, it's increment, unearned increment through land price increase, which is ultimately driven by banks, which is driven by private debt. He, John Bates Clark came along and he said, there is no uh, distinction between earned and unearned income. It's all the same. Now that's a disaster. Because what we should be doing with the tax system is putting the tax system to work to capture the, un the unearned wealth. We should be going hard after that. Why? Because then you allow the real economy to function perfectly. Or you allow people the opportunity to go out uh, and, and make the real economy work. Why? Because you take taxes off wages, you take taxes off labor, and you put taxes on something which, which then suppresses at the land market because we don't want a really, uh, because of the, uh, the symptoms that Sarah pointed out, we don't want a land market that's super, super uh, uh, pumped, juiced, if you like. Why? Because they can't get talent. The war for talent in all the in businesses across London is, is phenomenal. Why? because they can't live anywhere. I mean, it's very obvious. So that, that little that moment where he says there's no distinction, and by the way, the reason he did that is he said, because you know what, uh, it all goes towards GDP, and we're only measuring GDP. Since when was GDP a good measure of, of a nation's health? Transactional. So lastly, or penultimately, what I'd say to you is, if um, today we're going to focus on an absolute solution or focus on a working surface about you know, where we should focus our attention because there are a million battles we could be fighting because of the amount of inequality and injustice and social uh, inju injustice, injustice today, um, then what I would suggest we do is start to uh, talk liberally about recognizing or re-recognizing the difference between earned and unearned income. Um, and then suddenly you get to the point where you go, well, hang on, if we've already got stuff in the economy that exists, why uh, are we uh, inflating, namely houses, why are we inflating the prices of those things? Um, because basically it's really unproductive. Um, and uh, the bankers will say to you, you're socialist. And we'll say, no, no, we're, 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 call it what you want, but we're, we want a free market, we want a free labor market, so people can go and, and work and, and better themselves, better their communities because they ultimately have some kind of duty of care to those communities. Lastly, this was on the same page of the Sunday Times supplement, March 2015. Um, help to buy, backed by the uh, UK government. Poorest cannot eat food, minister admits. No one sees the link. That, I've, just I've just, over those 16 slides, that is the link. If you impose austerity on top of what I've just described, you have got the perfect failure of government, of economics, of social policy, of, of housing policy, and also the absolute obliteration of the real economy. So if you're saying to me, what do you, okay, Ross, what do you want? I'll tell you what I want. I want taxes on unearned wealth. Um, I, want, I, want, I never want to sit at another dinner party and people say, oh, it's amazing, my house has gone up 80%. I never want to hear that again. Because they think it's because they put a chrome tap in. You know, like I, point, I painted the walls magnolia and I put a parquet floor in and it went 80 No, you didn't. No, you didn't. That's not the reason. No, no, it bloody is. Would you like more creme fresh? No, I don't want more. I, I just want you, I want this lunacy to stop. Um, 
you know, one, one of the things about money is it makes people more them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, when you, it makes you more you. I know very wealthy people who do m wonderful things with money and you'd never know. And I also know, know people who could be termed sort of, you know, a bit um, blasé. Uh, and, and, and I think land speculation, this is an aside, just gives money to exactly the wrong people for exactly the wrong reasons. Um, and, and that has to stop. Land speculation is fundamentally uh, a, a, a pernicious social uh, uh, aspect of our economies. And this here, it's happening on our watch. And this are in, absolutely fully entwined. So, earned wealth, keep it. Let's redesign the tax system so you can keep it. It's not being taken from you. And the state is seen as a, the corrosive language around the state goes away because you can keep it. Unearned wealth, great. Let's tax it. Um, wasn't yours to begin with. Owe it to, owe it to the community. And then you can get the Daily Mail to stop writing those pieces about hoodies because um, suddenly we've got a, a well-functioning economy. At a, time where, at a time where robots are coming in, automation's coming in, and you're going to have a huge... Uh, so you're going to have a, 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 a workforce which is so materially different to, to what we see today. This is my last point, and it is that... Um, five, we don't know the jobs that are needed in the next five years. They haven't been invented today. Right, so, uh, at the, so what you're going to have is an economy with the wealthy at the top, uh, inverted commas, wealth, uh, entrepreneurs, um, and, and that, that's probably it. Then you're going to have a, a very tiny market of professionals in the middle, because when blockchain comes in, they're going to take all those jobs away, um, certainly banking. And, and then at the bottom, you're going to have a morass, a huge amount of people who are living hand to mouth. How the hell do you support that economy? Um, you support it by addressing the economy as a design job. We need to uh, tax unearned wealth. And what we need to do is give people at the bottom the opportunity to go and, and make their life, make their, make their way. That's it. Um, thank you very much for listening.